it's now time to begin with the second round table. Uh, let me introduce today's panelists. Antidia Sitores, who is the spokesperson and lobbying manager at Surfrider Foundation Europe. Bonjour. Good morning. Uh, Antidia is actually with me today, far enough for being allowed not to wear a mask. <laughs> Soren Wonga, uh, European coordinator at Product at Winters Europe. Uh, good morning, Soren. I think that I will need your help to pronounce your name the right way. That was pretty good, actually. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Benjamin Billet, General Secretary at the European Network of Outdoor Sports. Good morning. Bonjour, Benjamin. Bonjour. Good morning. Uh, Michel Nekvazil, Climate Change Adaptation Expert at the European Con Commission. Good morning. Good morning. Bonjour. Tout le monde. Um, before, before we begin, uh, I, I, I'll ask you to present yourself quickly, uh, just to remind the public that they can ask their questions. So I will begin with you, Antidia, if you can present yourself quickly. Bonjour, bonjour à tous. Donc, je ferai en français et euh, ravi d'être présent avec vous. Donc, je suis euh, euh, responsable du lobby au sein de l'association. Donc, euh, on parle ici euh, d'influence, d'influence euh, des institutions euh, publiques européennes, la commission euh, dont vous faites partie, euh, Michel, mais aussi au niveau français. Euh, et quand on parle d'influence, on parle justement de dialogue, de convaincre, euh, d'agir. C'est le cas auprès des institutions, mais c'est aussi le cas auprès des entreprises pour être facteur de changement. Did you hear me, Soren? Uh, sorry, I'm having Oh, sorry. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> yes, uh, no, first of all, thanks so much for organizing this event. We are very excited to be here at Protect Our Winter. We actually hear you very far, Soren. Okay, is this better? I think, yeah, much better. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. No, I was just saying thank you very much for organizing this event and this timely topic. And we're very excited to be here as uh, Protect Our Winters. And uh, yes, my name is Søren Ronge. I am the European coordinator for Protect Our Winters Europe. And for those who don't know PAO, PAO is a community of outdoor athletes, of creatives, of forward thinking businesses and athletes. And we try to bring forward climate policies, climate solutions to protect our world uh, for today and also for future generations. And under the umbrella of Protect Our Winters Europe, we bring together the nine national organizations that we have in Europe to also act on European policy level and to unite our network. So great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Søren, we, we still hear you pretty low. So I don't know if you could, you, if you could put it louder maybe the sound of the microphone. We'll try that for, for the next intervention. Uh, Benjamin? Good morning. Um, morning. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Um, my name is Benjamin Pierre, and I'm presenting the European Network of Outdoor Sports, ENOS, which was established in 2013 to represent the interests of outdoor sports in the broadest sense at European level. Uh, for you that don't know the network, it involves national and regional sport development agencies, outdoor sports federation, local authorities, academic institutions, and grassroots sports organizations. I work for the French Ministry of Sports as policy officer at the National Resource Center for Outdoor Sports, which is based in vallon pont d'Arc, South Ardèche which serves as a secretariat for the European network. Oh, you definitely live in a very nice place. Michel? Uh, you, you have to put your mic on. Bonjour. Uh, Good morning. Here you are. <laughs> Much better. Yeah. Uh, myself, personally, I'm, uh, I'm a sportsman. Yeah, Mostly outdoor. 
Messi is ambassador for it and Marcelo Unga diplomas behind me and uh, um, I do lots of orienteering still competitively and uh, a lot of climbing and ski alpinism and uh, uh, etc. When it comes to my professional life, I am with uh, the European Commission at Director General for Climate Change and I'm dealing in particular with climate change adaptation. So not necessarily how, to, how the sport should adapt to climate change, but, uh, but how we should all adapt to, uh, to climate change, but sport is part of it. And I'm dealing with what is called climate pact and uh, I'm going to cover it in my intervention. So looking forward for the session. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Well, we will begin with you and Tidia because we need to see what is the current situation of outdoor sports. Well, the current situation, uh, well, I switched to French. I think that we have yeah, really good you, translator. Yeah, you, you, guys, <laughs> you guys can switch to the, to the language you, you want. We have absolutely great translators, so you won't miss anything. Donc la, la, la situation pour les, pour les sports euh, outdoor, comme on dit en bon français, euh, c'est euh, deux menaces. Une menace autour euh, de la question de la qualité de l'eau, de la montée des eaux, quand on parle de tout ce qui est euh, relatif à une activité euh, nautique. Et également, mais je pense que, que Pau en, en parlera beaucoup mieux que moi, tout ce qui est relatif au changement climatique et donc à l'influence sur la, la montagne, l'influence sur le milieu, la disparition euh, de la neige à certaines périodes, des glaciers. Euh, donc je me, je me concentrerai justement sur la partie nautique, qui est l'ADN de Surfrider depuis, euh, depuis plus de 30 ans euh, en Europe. Et euh, les différentes menaces qu'il y a sur le milieu, euh, elles vont être la première liée euh, au Gulf Stream. Le Gulf Stream ralentit euh, avec le changement climatique, donc assez euh, basiquement pour le surfeur, moins de Goldstream, moins de vagues euh, et donc moins de spots sur lesquels surfer. C'est assez, euh, assez automatique. Il y a d'autres effets qui sont, euh, eux, plus indirects, qui vont peut-être agir sur la question de la qualité de l'eau euh, parce qu'on va avoir plus de sécheresse, moins de euh, quantité d'eau, moins de ressources dans des endroits qui ne seront plus navigables en kayak, euh, plus navigables dans d'autres secteurs. Et aussi, puisque euh, plus de sécheresse, euh, évidemment bah, avoir une qualité d'eau moins bonne, des concentrations de polluants plus importantes, du chimique, du bactériologique. Et là, on va se retrouver avec un usager qui va être particulièrement exposé euh, à ces polluants, à ces euh, bactéries. Donc, c'est aussi pour ça que Surfrider bah, porte un manifesto dont certains euh, sont co-signataires co euh, aujourd'hui euh, et qui a vocation à alerter la Commission européenne sur cette mise en danger, au final, de la santé des pratiquants d'activité nautique qui ne disposent pas d'informations. En fait, quand ils vont se baigner, quand on se baigne en hiver, il n'y a pas de drapeau pour nous dire euh, est-ce que la qualité de l'eau, elle est bonne ou pas. Donc, de nombreuses, de nombreuses menaces, mais je, je voulais mettre le, euh, la focale sur ce point-là en particulier et débattre avec les autres, des, des autres menaces. Uh, so if, if we can move to you, Seren, because we talked about the, the seas, tell us about the situation in the mountains. Can you talk to me now? Sorry. Yeah, um, much better. Okay, perfect. I managed to, to fix this. Now, so of course, uh, Protect Our Winters, we're trying to, to really represent the entire outdoor community. But uh, as our name implies, we are very much focused on winter. Our history began in the mountains. So we are concerned about protecting our winters. And especially when it comes to the impacts of climate change, uh, it's very much visible when it comes to snow and winter and mountains. So what we have seen really is that the impacts are not somewhere in the future, but they're actually here already and uh, we have to act upon them today. And just to give some examples of how this is affecting outdoor sports, I think everybody today has seen examples of uh, cross-country competition, biathlon competitions, where you just really have a wide stretch of snow surrounded by green meadows uh, with this snow being trucked in from afar because there was just not enough snow there to host this event or competition. And uh, for the Alps as a whole, the global warming is happening about two times faster than the global average. So we've already seen about two degrees warming happening in the Alps. 
And that basically means that the 4,000 glaciers that we currently have in the Alps are uh, probably going to lose half of their ice by 2050. And uh, we also know that if we do nothing, the Alps will lose up to 70% of their snow cover by the end of the century. And we're still in a place today where we can reduce that to 30% if we manage to get on a pathway for 1.5 degrees warming. And that obviously has a lot of consequences for our outdoor sports, uh, but also for the social aspects and the economic aspects and the environmental aspects, as Antilia was just mentioning. And uh, as our founder, Jeremy Jones, likes to say, um, when we will not be able to ski anymore, that will be the least of our problems in the future, because then we really have other things that we need to be worried about. And uh, I think uh, other impacts that we are facing are, for example, also in the summer, we can see that the permafrost uh, in the soils is reducing. That leads, obviously, to an increased risk of disasters, of natural hazards, posing threats for entire mountain villages, uh, reshaping also the iconic shape of our mountains and just making traditional routes that used to be very popular in the Alps dangerous because of the risk of rock falls. And then, of course, there are all these other risks that Antilia just mentioned, also when it comes to water sports such as whitewater, kayaking, rafting, and so on. And that's why we're very happy also to work with surf riders on these issues. Uh, Benjamin Billet, if you can give us your view of the current situation of outdoor sports. Yeah, thanks. I totally agree. It's no, there's no doubt snow sports are, are some of the most affected by climate change, but virtually every type of outdoor sports, just like Søren said, is affected by climate change from, from wild water activities to countryside recreation. Uh, for, for, the, the, for countryside recreation, climate change is having a more indirect but no less potent effect. A recent study has shown that nine of ten outdoor sports professionals from Italy and France working in the Alps were observing a direct or indirect impact on their professional activity. So global warming impacts on visitors, places and the activities themselves. And outdoor sports participants are spending a lot of time outside and, and they can witness a progression of change. Uh, what they are seeing now that there is more variability and less reliability in, in the seasons, in the weather, uh, disrupted weather patterns are becoming more common and then what used to be the norm uh, of, of predictable weather and, and it, unseasonable the storms are coming, becoming a common occurrence. We, we have, it's great for wave surfers, but make sports at sea like sea diving, sailing and kayaking dangerous. Um, so the ways that the public recreates outdoors is, is already undergoing dramatic change and recreation options in many urban areas have become much more limited in, in the face of extreme heat waves, for instance. Uh, Michel, if, if we can have your, your point of view, I, okay, this is your back. <laughs> Perfect. Used to switching off camera and mic, so uh, uh, yeah, uh, I cannot agree more. I like the quotation of uh, the skiing being the least of a problem when we can't do it anymore because the, we'll have much more trouble in our, our daily life. Yeah, I just agree with everything that has been, uh, has been said uh, of myself in my very short life. I remember being a child and digging out uh, the door of uh, the cottage in the Czech mountains uh, where I come from the Czech Republic because it was, uh, you know, it, it was simply not visible because of snow. And yeah, now we, when we get uh, our 20 centimeters of snow for uh, cross-country skiing, we, uh, we are happy. So it's, uh, it's happening extremely, extremely quickly uh, in the, with, uh, with the summer sports. And uh, I do a lot of, uh, of white water. So still it was perfectly possible to, uh, to do um, kayaking and canoeing in the Czech Republic. Uh, during summer now, there is uh, not enough water to do it on most of, uh, uh, of the rivers. Yes, yeah, so it's happening fast, but I would not like to sound uh, um, nostalgic. Yeah, the, uh, our only, <laughs> only way is that uh, uh, we simply acknowledge the fact that it's happening and we discuss uh, what we are going to, uh, to do about it. My last point at this stage, 
uh, I would like to bring in also other sports that we may not call outdoor, uh, but are very popular and many people are involved, such as uh, uh, football and, te or, and tennis. It's usually, it's usually, out hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah perfect. Uh, and here is extremely important the issue of, uh, of water. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and maybe we can discuss it uh, later if uh, the participants are interested. Uh, because there is amazing amount of water uh, that is being used for irrigation of football pitches and uh, irrigation of tennis uh, tennis fields, for instance. Mm -hmm. But also we know that we use water also for uh, fabricating the snow, artificial snow in winter. And what is happening is that uh, we are often damaging uh, the status of water bodies yeah? because we are we have to take it from somewhere and the somewhere is a river is a lake and uh, uh, and we are just uh, creating or worsening uh, already existing problem and here there are solutions yeah like uh, the uh, using of, uh, of a better use of rainwater etc cetera, etc cetera. that's it from from me for now um how can we we're gonna begin by thinking how can we protect those outdoor sports what can we do what do we have to adapt them to, to the climate change i don't know if you on, on est déjà en train d'adapter euh, les sports euh, justement à ce changement climatique euh, vous parliez euh, des tempêtes alors il est vrai que euh, certains euh, Nazaré, que ce soit Nazaré ou Bellara euh, sont des vagues qui n'apparaissent qu'en période de tempête donc on peut avoir euh, un, un aspect on va dire un tout petit peu bénéfique du changement climatique mais au final c'est pour une élite de euh, quelques surfeurs qui sont en capacité d'aller euh, surfer euh, des vagues qui font plusieurs étages donc ça n'est pas forcément le but poursuivi l'objectif c'est de partager une passion, partager avec les enfants, avec le plus grand nombre, cette passion du sport et cette passion de l'environnement dans lequel on est. Donc, comment s'adapter aussi Il y a aussi notre façon de s'adapter à terre face au changement climatique. Un des réflexes des collectivités locales, parfois, c'est que pour s'adapter à cette montée des eaux, on va construire, construire des digues, construire en dur, et euh, on ne pense pas assez ou pas encore euh, à des euh, propositions qui seraient fondées euh, sur la nature. C'est autant de points sur lesquels on peut progresser, euh, travailler en concertation et s'inspirer euh, justement d'adaptations en littoral qui, euh, au lieu d'artificialiser, euh, vont être un repli euh, dans les zones moins littorales ou encore être euh, justement en capacité de se dire on ne vit plus sur le littoral on en profite essentiellement pour les loisirs mais on n'est pas d'habitat ou d'infrastructure et puis aussi il y a cette question euh, du one health euh, à la fois la santé environnementale mais la santé euh, euh, des pratiquants et dans cette appréhension il y a forcément euh, comme le disait très bien Michel, une gestion de l'eau qui est améliorée et qui est euh, observée dans le cadre d'un cycle complet euh, de l'eau, euh, de la montagne euh, jusqu'au terrain agricole, jusqu'au terrain de jeu euh, des surfeurs. Et dans ce cadre-là, c'est important de d'adresser un dialogue sur tout le bassin versant, euh, de sorte à ce que tous les usages ne deviennent pas un conflit d'usages. Absolutely. Uh, Seren, what, what can we do? How can we protect those outdoor sports? What kind of policy can we implement? Well, I think uh, I agree with Antilia and uh, the role of sport when it comes to adaptation or protection. Uh, I see a huge potential for sports to use its visibility. Obviously, obviously it's super popular with our community. And we, what we have found at POW also is that the people who engage in outdoor sports usually have a very natural connection to their outdoor places. They identify with them, they cherish them, they use them as a place of, of refuge. So they have an inherent interest also in protecting them. So this is a huge opportunity to use this platform to talk to them about climate change, talk to them how about their places are affected. And uh, the question is, how do we turn that into the necessary policy changes that, that we need? You know? So at Protect Our Winters, what we do really is we work in three different priority areas. And one is 
focusing on cultural change, behavioral change. We try to engage with the outdoor community themselves. We try to find steps and ways that they themselves can take to reduce their individual footprints to become uh, better climate advocates. But obviously, this also includes the outdoor industry that has a huge role to play and a huge responsibility. And I think uh, what can be done, it's fairly well documented. For us at the European level, we have a strong focus on transport and mobility. We know that this is a huge sector where we produce emissions when it comes to outdoor travel. So there's different things you can do when, that have been discussed also during these two events already. But uh, talk, taking fans to the venues, taking athletes to events, taking them to the training sessions, how you arrange schedules, where are the localities of these events. But then also when it comes to the sourcing of food, of the use of plastic, the use of waste, and obviously improving buildings, improving energy efficiency, improving the use of renewable energies. And when it comes to industry, there are many ways that they can improve their own footprint uh, by measuring, by using mitigation techniques, but also by employing circular economy concepts. But what we find is the very most important aspect of this whole work is to engage on systemic level. So that means all of these individuals, the industry, the athletes, the outdoor community, they have to use their voice to really push for systemic changes. And the outdoor industry, for example, they have a huge potential, they have a huge lever if they get together to engage. So we try to provide them with a platform where they can easily take action, where they can speak up upon their demands to really see uh, what can be changed. Benjamin Billet? Yeah. Um... This is very interesting what, what Søren just brought uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, ideas. One of the things that I think has not really been discussed since the beginning of the conference is a link, <clears throat> the link between biodiversity challenges and the climate change and the whole area of rewilding. Uh, rewilding holds great hope for both biodiversity and carbon capture. And, and one of the important ways in which rewilding is, is relevant to building a sustainable future is that it enables us to forge new relationships with the wider natural world. And an interesting example for that is uh, reintroduction of European beaver who builds ponds that reduce flooding instances, also stop draining uplands and farmlands, but rather plant native water absorbing species such as European willow, which stabilizes river banks, reduces erosion. You, 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 there are a lot of benefits that you can get from that. And, and, and it creates also very interesting environments for canoeing and kayaking or fishing. Uh, so it, it can offer enormous benefits downstream in terms of sustainable active tourism that we, we, we didn't talk that much about either. Um, right at the outset, when, when ENOS was formed, um, the members wanted to address the area of sustainability. So, so when you were asking uh, uh, about existing policies, um, the, 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 every ENOS member signs out a charter and commits to meet agreed sustainability standards. Uh, but we, 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 and we try to promote messages and how to behave responsibly and, 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 and to bring out uh, sustainability, the sustainability dimension. Uh, so we've developed 10 principles that are quite easy for everyone to relate to for responsible use of protected to areas in partnership with the Europark Federation, as an example. That's very interesting. Michel, how yes, can we uh, protect outdoors and what kind of policy can be implemented? Absolutely. Yeah, huge responsibility in that. <laughs> well, we we are we're trying to do our best. <laughs> uh, the there are two parts of the um, of the reply. One is mitigation, the other one is adaptation. And the the sad thing, or could be turned positive, uh, about climate change is there is no single response. Yeah, so it's combination of uh, uh, of a million of small steps if we want to. Um, to find a solution. When it comes to mitigation, it has been discussed to a large extent. So simply we have to do everything we can to reduce uh, uh, the emissions, including from, uh, from sports, 
but we know, and the climate science is clear about it, that whatever we do, do now, the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere will diminish only very, very slowly. So even if we stop the emissions now, today, we'll still have to face uh, the impacts of climate change for uh, the, in the years to come. So together with climate change adaptation, reducing uh, greenhouse, ga uh, greenhouse gases, we have to take adaptation steps. And in terms of sport, um, we are already on the way, I would say. Uh, if I take uh, winter sports again, um, the, um, there, the, we found a way how to create an artificial snow. There is a problem with water that we need to solve. Perhaps we need to look at uh, other ways how to fabricate snow. Perhaps we need to look into summer versions of popular sports like the biathlon that's perfectly, perfectly, perfectly adapted to it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I mentioned already, already uh, the problem uh, of football tennis. I want to bring it in even if it's not really an outdoor outdoor sport because it creates a huge uh, huge problem and there are, there are easy solutions to it yeah and also for for winter and other sports in capturing the rainwater yeah so if for instance you have a stadium be it football be it tennis it has huge roofs usually and draining the the water the rainwater uh, underground and then using this water for irrigation is extremely simple. It's uh, it's it's very cheap, and uh, it uh, we are not uh, not obliged to uh, to use uh, to use drinking water. So these are, I mean, the first uh, ideas that we uh, that uh, can be done in practical ways. And I would like to use this opportunity to mention the climate pact, uh, something that uh, uh, the European Commission uh, has uh, started. Uh, uh, at the end of this year, at the end of last year, uh, together, for instance, with the International Oly Olympic Committee and uh, other organizations. And the idea is actually to raise awareness uh, on climate, uh, climate change and to support uh, all the existing and new actions. So the idea is that people, per, uh, uh, individuals and organizations can make a pledge what I am or my organization will do for uh, for climate. People can become ambassadors on their behalf or uh, on behalf of their organizations of, uh, of climate pact can organize events. So so it's uh, it's in my opinion the of utmost importance that uh, uh, we really make people aware, interested, and hence, uh, we also cr create a pressure on politicians, et cetera, and we uh, multiply the uh, impact of our action. Uh, before we move to the Q&A session, uh, if you want to add something, you, the, the, the floor is yours. There's no floor today. Je veux peut-être réagir sur les, les derniers euh, propos de, de Michel, justement, puisque Surfrider est aussi ambassadeur du Climate Pact, euh, avec Yana Prokofieva qui, qui prend euh, vraiment aussi à cœur sa, cette notion d'adaptation au changement climatique, mais on parle aussi euh, très peu de l'atténuation. Et si on veut justement euh, arriver à cet accord de Paris, on a une double responsabilité. La France a une responsabilité dans son leadership de la présidence française de l'Union européenne. Ce sera après la République tchèque euh, et c'est à chaque pays, chaque personne euh, de réduire sa propre, euh, sa propre empreinte plastique, sa propre empreinte climat euh, lorsqu'il va choisir euh, des équipements sportifs. Euh, il y a de nombreuses marques qui ont décidé d'aller vers l'alternative au néoprène, qui ont décidé d'aller vers euh, l'alternative à l'époxy pour ce qui est euh, du surf. Donc on a aussi cette capacité, nous en tant que consommateurs, de faire le choix de surfer peut-être à quelques encablures en train euh, plutôt que d'aller à Tahiti euh, ou encore euh, avoir la possibilité de faire le choix de ces matériaux, de matériaux durables et peut-être pas euh, de matériaux en plastique euh, premier prix euh, qui finalement ne feront qu'une saison euh, quand on choisit euh, de euh, 
commencer une pratique. Il y a aussi toute une économie de réseau, de fonctionnalités qui peuvent être développées, là encore de partage intersportif, qui peuvent avec les fédérations travailler ensemble. Et je sais que dans nos réseaux, on a cette capacité à, à délivrer ce partage d'une passion, mais aussi le partage au final d'un matériel commun pour pratiquer ensemble. I don't know if someone wants to add something before we move to the Q&A. I'd like to make a quick comment on the importance of, of uh, um, the value of partnership working and the role of outdoor sports, of the outdoor sports sector to lead the way. Uh, we wouldn't have been involved in this webinar without our partnership with Surfrider um, in, in the importance of partnership working to achieve the goals, th these goals cannot be overstated. Uh, so we need to, to look at the, the sector in its entirety and to, to make, maybe make a call. Um, with, with the reach of outdoor sports uh, comes responsibility. We know from the European sport barometer that 60% uh, of, of people that are practicing sport are doing it outdoors. And the outdoor sports community is passionate about nature, but the house is not in order. We do things that are not as good as they could be. And we would like to see an increased number of integrated policies on environment, uh, on environmental impact, including outdoor education and environmental ethics systematically adopted by outdoor sports organizations and to translate the sustainable development goals into the own activity or build own models. So maybe that's something to, to bring to the discussion. I just want to echo really what, what I heard from Michal, from Benjamin, and from Ancelia here. I think also for us it's the same. No, obviously, it is not only a question of adaptation, no, because we know that even if we started now, as Michal said, to stop our emissions, we would still see the impacts of global warming happening on our mountains. At the same time, we also know that the adaptation capacities in many countries are almost exhausted when it comes to technical adaptation of ski resorts, for example. So uh, we also work very hard to try to introduce mobility concepts. And I think the European Union with the new Green Deal and with their sustainable and smart uh, transport strategy that they have introduced are definitely on the right way when it comes to a shift to rail. And uh, from our side, and I'm very happy to see that also Surfrider is encouraging this, we're really trying to push our community to make more use of a low carbon emissions form of travel to take the train more efficiently. And we would also like to really see the European Union introduce better mobility concepts with better connectivity, with more frequency and just overall quality of the rail network. So very excited to see what comes out of this European year of the rail. And uh, yeah, just wanted to add that to the discussion. Let me switch on mic when we go. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, and indeed, uh, uh, as uh, I tried to say in the beginning, there are, uh, there is no one single solution. Yeah, there are many, uh, and you you did mention a lot. Just one one point: uh, people, uh, outdoor sportsmen of any kind, are first popular and very credible. Yeah. So this the story of how the situation was some time ago, how it is now that we really do see the impacts of climate change and we do have to do something about it, all of us, uh, is very powerful. And uh, we would very much welcome uh, help of some of you, of, uh, of your, uh, of the people you are going out with uh, that might be interested uh, in becoming uh, climate pack ambassadors, yeah, these are really the people with whom we like to uh, we we pamper them in terms of uh, providing all the information, all the support, uh, everything. And these people um, set a good example, and uh, they uh, keep in touch with their communities, with their network, and they spread awareness about the situation and about what uh, uh, what could be done. So. Uh, I'll post in the chat uh, uh, the link to the website of uh, European Climate Pact, where you can find everything about the pledges, about ambassadors and uh, events and uh, uh, everything that's ongoing. Um, 
thank you so much. It's absolutely interesting everything that that you guys are saying. I just pick up one question from the the Q and A section. Um, the federation, the International Federation of Ski, has just released its schedule for the 21-22 season. And from what I've understand, uh, what I've understood, it's going to be Europe, then Japan, then flying back to Europe, and then flying to Beijing for the Olympic Games. So the question was, what action could organization like PO or maybe the European Union or international um, other international bodies, uh, what action can they have to influence a better scheduling and less lessing the, the global impact, particularly on winter sports? When you see this kind of scheduling, you, don't you think we can do better, maybe Europe? then Japan, then China, so that they don't have to fly the word? The short answer is yes, yes, we can definitely <laughs> do better. <laughs> and uh, yeah, absolutely no. And uh, I mean, on the positive side, we are sometimes approached by major events uh, or organizers of major events like the IBU, for example, who are actually actively asking us for guidance, for support to develop their own strategies to engage, like Michael was also just saying, uh, to train their athletes to talk about uh, climate change with their athletes, to make them more aware. And we have seen some positive um, initiatives happening. For example, we have been in discussion with the Freeride World Tour to see how they could arrange their tour stops to make it uh, that more of their athletes are actually taking maybe the train or the bus to certain tour stops. And I totally agree. Um, it's necessary to get into discussions and engage with these bodies to make sure that the scheduling makes more sense and to also try to really encourage where possible to take the train, to take uh, low carbon forms of transport. But at the same time, we often have these discussions and be very much aware that as international <clears throat> professional athletes, there is a certain footprint that is unavoidable. You, you, it's still international competition, so certain flying will not be possible to eliminate but then to look for a way to maybe offset or compensate those emissions that are unavoidable. Yeah, the, it, it, the, it's only it's always this this question just limited the impact because we can't cancel it. I mean, it makes sense. They have to race in Japan. They have to race at the Olympic Games. But the idea, I guess, of the question was more a better scheduling. Uh, Benjamin uh, Antidia. Il faut savoir aussi que le ski n'est pas le seul sport dans lequel il y a des incohérences. On a choisi Tahiti pour l'épreuve de surf au moment des Jeux Olympiques. Donc, on a aussi choisi à la fois de faire rayonner les Outre-mer et en même temps, on a choisi un bilan carbone assez catastrophique de la compétition. On construit à l'heure actuelle des surf parks en zone littorale, c'est-à-dire qu'on a un spot de surf à Saint-Sébastien, on a un spot de surf sur le littoral aquitain et on va construire des vagues artificielles dites parfaites, euh, qui ont, elles, un véritable impact carbone. On est en train d'artificialiser pour faire une vague qui existe déjà. Donc, les incohérences, il y en a de nombreuses. C'est important entre nous, justement, de les pointer du doigt pour ne pas euh, recommencer euh, ces aspects-là ou pour réfléchir. Euh, Soren parlait de compensation. Euh, il y a peut-être aussi des moyens euh, dans la compétition, dans la façon de, de la construire au départ, dans la sélection même des pays, de penser dans les critères euh, du CEO, de savoir est-ce que le bilan carbone ne pourrait peut-être pas être plus priorisé euh, que la capacité euh, des sponsors à porter telle ou telle compétition. You, you were talking about building surf park. It's it's a very personal um, comment, but close to my home in Paris, they are actually building a surf park. I guess that in life, if in the future you you want to protect a bit the the climate and the environment, you have to decide. If you live in Paris, you just can't surf. That's the point. I mean, <laughs> I I just don't understand what we what we need to use so many so much water. To, to make people from Paris happy and allow them to surf. Surf should be in the nature, I guess. Well, to, 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 this, is, this was very personal. Uh, Benjamin, if we can move on to you about the, the better scheduling and maybe the, the, a better organization. Yeah, that was a very interesting example. Uh, a, a very interesting example. Uh, I would like here to mention some initiatives for 
from, for instance, trade runners, and, uh, uh, and one of them being uh, Kylian Jornet, who is actually proposing to sponsors and event organizers a different scheduling. And this is a very interesting example because uh, I know from the talks we had with, with, with the, 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 the athletes that are behind this initiative that they need uh, the support from, from other uh, stakeholders. And, and, and we, I, I would like here to make a link to the very interesting concluding remarks from yesterday from Dan Reading and the very really insightful content of Lowry McLaren yesterday also in the project they were running. Uh, about the need to acknowledge the power of collaborative partnership and work together over our sectors with grassroots organizations, local authorities, the outdoor sports industry, governmental bodies, and uh, at national European level, um, and to form strategic partnership. It, it's not possible for one single stakeholder to make change. Michelle, one final word. Uh, just just to remind everybody that you you can go to the Q and A session. Actually, Michelle posted many many interest interesting links. But Michelle, if you want to add something be before we close this second round table of today, just one point. Yeah, we are uh, now trying to do what we can with the International Olympic Committee uh, in terms of. Tokyo, inshallah, and, uh, and Beijing uh, Olympic Games, but we are already working towards the Paris uh, Olympic Games. And uh, the idea is that we make the, the Paris Olympic Games uh, uh, an example of how sport events can be organized in a little bit different and much more climate-friendly uh, way. So here with us, I know that uh, many of the participants are somehow involved and somehow attached to, uh, to sport in, uh, in Paris. Please, uh, please help us in this effort. And uh, it will involve not only how Olympics have been organized till now, but a lot of out of box thinking and trying to do, trying to do things really in a, in a different and better way. We still have some time, so let's go for it. <laughs> Let's work together, actually. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the panelists this morning. Thank you, and TJ, she was close to me, so I can say it in a, in a closest way. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for you who are uh, following us. Thank you to Mara. We can see your, your drawing of this morning. Yeah, it was, it was a very rich round table. Um, we will have a quick break. Please don't... Uh, don't don't switch off your your cameras your microphone everything we will be there uh, we will be back in uh, around half an hour we'll be back at a quarter to 12. you can keep on sending questions on the q a session if the panelists have time to answer the the question that have been asked and we couldn't answer in the session please do so uh thank you for for being with us we will be back in a after a short break see you Thanks a lot to Surf Rider Foundation. Bye -bye. Thanks a lot.